So, Barry, welcome. Thank Glad you. Glad you can make it. Um, uh, great to see Jason Bourne up on the first time I'd seen it on the on the big screen, yeah, yeah. actually. And uh, it's a pretty breathless piece of cinema. It I is. Have to say. Yeah, you're right. And it's uh, it sort of grabs you by the lapel and just careers you through two hours of mayhem and uh, and intrigue. And it's uh, and that's and the power of it, I think, is lies very much in your in your in your camera Thank you. work. Thank you. That's a very much big part of it. Yeah. Um, just for, for some of you who don't, I'm sure most of you do know Barry and Barry's work, but just a, a little potted history. Um, Barry, you came through you came through documentaries during the eighties, yeah. yeah. doing television documentaries. Uh, you you then started working with Ken Loach, and then you did. Pretty much all his films for about fifteen years. It was a little bit more than fifteen. Fifteen <laughs> up to yeah. up to yeah. when the wind shakes the barley. At least barley. a dozen films, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which are the last one. I particularly, I think, it was a beautiful, beautiful film. Yeah, yeah. Actually, and uh, actually, it was interesting going through your IMDb again, and how many sort of really quite iconic films of the last 10, 15 years yeah. that you've done. And yeah. I just went to it, oh my God, is that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, thanks, um, thanks. Uh, The Hurt Locker, for instance, which uh, I believe the New York Times, uh, is, it's in its top 10 of the best films so far this century. Okay. Somewhere, so, okay. you know, yeah. that's... And, uh, <laughs> and uh, The Big Short, um, a few years ago, which was one of the most watchable yeah, films. Yeah, and that's a oh, slight God. variation on my yeah. style. But yeah. uh, what have I got here? Uh, uh, and Coriolanus, and, and some, of the, well, some of the great TV shows, like The Lost Prince, which I thought yeah, were beautiful. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. fantastic thank you. Thank you. catalogue of work. Yeah. So, uh, let's talk about Jason Bourne. Mm -hmm. um, you've, 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 done about, you've done three films with Paul Greengrass yeah. prior to this. So, what was it like coming to coming to the fifth in the series of Jason Bourne. Was it, I mean, was it, was, was it you joining the gang or was it you and Paul coming back together again? Well, yeah, obviously, it's, uh, Paul had made uh, the, f he didn't do the very first Bourne, yeah. which is interesting to know because that has a, a particular, well, quite a regular style of filmmaking. Uh, Paul introduced the kind of visceral style that, um, that we we followed in this uh it's a kind of question of like which came first you know the the visceral style or did i come i didn't come there and copy what was done before but i think it has to sit within that that same uh style you know so oliver wood uh, oliver wood uh, shot the other three or four of those or maybe all four of those films i'm not sure uh but he um you know, he, he already had that style nailed. And uh, there's a thing where you have a good director. The director forces you into places that you might not want to be sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, that could be good or bad. I've been lucky. The directors like Catherine Bigelow and Paul Greengrass have forced me into places that are particularly good, I think. And, I, you know, and, you know it, looking at the film, it, it seems like how on earth do we do it? It seems like an awful lot of work. At the time, it doesn't quite feel like that, but it did take over 100 days of shooting and, and nine months of your life. But it is, you know, it's all there. It's a big picture and a big, you know, big success. Yeah, as well, so. I mean, because you, you did, you worked with Paul on uh, United 93, which... Uh, yeah, and Captain Phillips, and, and Green Zone. And Captain Phillips, yeah. 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 And, and th those 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 stories had um, they were, they were based on true events. Yeah. So that that that, that yeah. style was, was honed in there because there was a sort of there was a sort of faithfulness to the to the events that were portrayed. Yeah, I think that's and right. I, you here, were, and here it was coming to a yeah. fictional story. You in, you you were told. I, I was very the, fortunate enough to work on United yeah, Ninety Three. You yeah. did, yeah. Uh, showed all that amazing thing at the end with the uh, with the pilots and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Was your stuff wasn't great. Um, Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, that's that was our first uh, collaboration, and it was a struggle to find out what it was that he wanted. I suppose the subject. I think Paul is great when he has a, a true story that he turns mm -hmm. into a, into a film. Uh, it's slightly different with the Bourne because it, they're inventing this world. You know, it's a fiction film. Of, you know, it's it's a fantasy film, I guess. You know. um, but it's. Um, 
the method there is that the story keeps coming back to you. You, you shoot some stuff. You, I mean, you must admit, the editing in this film is phenomenal. Christopher Rass, the editor, he, he also wrote this version of the film. And he was sending back information that you need to cover this, we'll do that. We brought, we brought one character back to life that was killed in the film. Uh, you know, there's, there's several things that went on during the filming that is, is all part of building and building and building mm -hmm. and building, you know, to make sure that this level of intensity is kept throughout, you know. I thought it was interesting, I think, in the opening, uh, uh, the classification of the film, eight, you know, it's 18, I think it said mild violence in it or something like that. It's like, <laughs> I didn't see any mild violence. I saw plenty of yeah. pretty horrific stuff yeah. in there. But, um, it's, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a big film. It had, yeah. You see the crew, the cast, and, you know, and our second unit. We're all phenomenal and all uh, you know, real pleasure to work with. Yeah. When, I, when I was on the set of United 93, I, was, I, I watched you do a scene in the, in the control center which governed the airspace of United States. And I, I saw how you and Paul constructed these sort of 20, 30, 45 minute takes yeah. Really, with cameras running in relay, yeah. and just the whole yeah. action, which was quite impressive. Yeah. And then you'd stop for about an equal amount of time, and then go again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, was was anything like that in this? To some uh, extent, yeah. yeah. I think there, again, there's very similar scenes inside the the hub, the blue scenes. Basically, yeah. um, they they could run for quite a while. Yeah. So that that would be, but nothing quite like. You know, 1993, it, it, it had a particular thing. We, got, we shouldn't really be talking about this film, it's not what you saw. But it, it had a, a structure which was based around a 90 minute event in history. So it was natural to try and keep the cameras running over that period. And that would seem easy nowadays when you're using digital cameras, but it was 35 mil film cameras, four perf, handheld, so it's four minute magazines. It was reloading on that film maybe up to seven or eight times and overlapping cameras, so you never stop the action. That's, it's not quite like that in this film, no. but that is, it's the principle behind it that we still maintain, mm -hmm. is that the space is given over to the actors, you know, they're not given marks to hit. I mean, the focus, I mean, there's, there's a few moments in here where the focus is just fighting to try and find it, but given the nature of how we film and, uh, and how intense it is when you're filming, it, you know, everyone on the folk, on you know, all the focus pullers just did an incredible job on this film. You know. hmm. No, for sure, yeah, for yeah. sure. Well, it's, so the, the, I mean, looking at the list of the the equipment on yeah. on this on this film yeah. is quite extensive. Just just talk us through the choice of cameras. Uh, yeah, we well we started off thinking we should all thirty five mil, uh, which we'd done on all the other films. So you know, Captain Phillips and so on. Um, but there was a lot of, uh, there was some influence from the second unit who knew that they were going to shoot somewhere in Las Vegas, but none of us really knew what the light levels would be. They also want to get instant playback for themselves and things. So we kind of figured, we factored in the fact that we could go and use uh, the Alexa uh, digitally for that. And there's a mixture of things in here, and as it was shot out of sequence, we started off with a lot of 35 mil cameras, which is the, we used the Penelope and the Alexa, uh, and the, sorry, and the Arri LT mixed. Uh, we used uh, 16 mil, so anything you see as a flashback or anything, uh, like through a scope or through, a, we used 16 mil cameras just to degrade things a little bit. Uh, and then there's a mixture of smaller cameras. I think we have the, you know, the Canon 300 and red cameras and things like that. But they were mostly used on second unit. And, and that is a whole another film in itself, really. There's two sections, the, both the chases. Uh, and, 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 yeah, both the chases are the, are the main second unit work, obviously. And um, th you're brilliantly directed by Simon Crane and shot by um, Igor Medlik. You're just a great team. You know, full, brilliant. Yeah. So. Mm. Well, I can say I'm glad I didn't do it. It was like it's not, it's not my style and it's not what I do. But I'm so pleased that they did it so well. You know. Yes, because I was going to ask about because your 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 operating technique is is 
you know, it's, it's sort of pivotal to, I think, the way that this film looks. And how, and how do you... How do you how do you pass that on to the other cameras? I mean, how do you disseminate that? that well, the, well, because we had plenty of prep time. We had right. lots of discussions, right, you know, weeks beforehand. Um, you know, I made it clear that we weren't going to alter our, our style, you know, to blend in with a, a, a more maybe conventional second unit. Mm. So they added all those things. They, uh, I mean, one of the things, I don't know. I wasn't fully aware of using Zooms and it, you, uh, where, as you watch the film, but we use Zooms almost all the time. There's always those little movements that concentrate your mind or, you know, did I hear, really hear that thing? Do I, do I change position here? Uh, almost everything, I wouldn't say it was handheld all the way, but I'd say maybe 60 or 70% of it was literally in the hand. But the, the rest of it was always on a slider, this, where you're moving slightly and the zoom is pushing in and, and you're listening to something and it's f completely loose and fluid on the head mm. so you know, if someone reaches down for something you've got a, gl a glimpse of that that's, that's the method and they took that and they put it into their uh, shooting Yeah, so, um, so they did the inc incorporated zooms into their shots and, right. and did little things like that because right, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It, it seems to be the art of of finding things just in time, yeah, yeah, and yeah. sort of, and even you might be a fraction late, and you know, normally you think, oh, actually, you know, can we go again on that? But actually, it's it just adds <laughs> to the sort of. Well, I think the secret know. is not to be too soon. You can't be ahead of the story. Yeah. So you're yeah. always trying to hit that moment where you capture capture the word. You know. Uh, yeah. If it's just a simple conversation between two people, you don't, you know, pan to the. Be, to get to the conversation before the line begins, you have to listen. It's now it's coming. Yeah, now that's it's right. coming. Now it's coming. You know, so it's it's good to be able to uh, empty your mind and not know too much. I know this is sounds strange, but not not to be too aware of what you're shooting. You know, like well, you, you're fully aware of what you're shooting, but not to be too conscious of the rhythm of the dialogue or or the consistency of anything. You know, yes. and we yeah. often change. The camera position, so things don't look or feel the same mm. as they did the last take or the last That's take right, before yeah. that. So you'll see many angles. We shot with three cameras, I should say, as well from the beginning. We shot with three cameras continuously, and we, but we'd always change those. So those three cameras after four or five takes looks like a dozen cameras, like a, dozen, a dozen different positions, you know. Yeah. And how, how does a, an old hand like Tommy Lee Jones react to that kind of filming? <laughs> Well, Tommy was, I've got to say, was very generous. <laughs> um, this, there was moments where he'd say, I'm going to get out of my chair now, and I'll slow down as I pass you like that. And I just said, thanks, Tommy, but we, you don't have to. You know, and, right. and then he, you know, he recognized that you know, the camera was, would capture everything that happened. You know? Right. Do, do, do you think he felt quite liberated by that? Well, he was generous to me, all I can say. And, and I, you know, <laughs> we had small conversations on set and he was generous and, you know, looks incredible. I think he's... It's the, the, te place, the texture it? of his face is just beyond, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And his expressions, you know. He's very droll and he does yeah. just the minimum he needs to do, but he's very... That minimum is, uh, is world-class, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Very good, very yeah. good. Um, by the way, if, if, if you want to pitch in with a question at any point, do, don't we? We, 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 we? We'll leave some time at the end, but if something occurs to you, just uh, throw your hand up. We've got some microphones somewhere that will go out. Um, and all, on all the on-set pictures of, I've seen of you, and I'm actually seeing you work, the, the camera's always, always on your shoulder, or invariably on your shoulder. Yeah, it's do, really, do, 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 do you ever use aids? <laughs> like the Easy Rig or Movies or anything. Did you ever go? No, I'm yeah. not sure. Easy Rig's a little bit. It's yeah, just yeah. another clumsier thing to put on sometimes. I can understand why people do it. Uh, you know, and we had three cameras, so um, always. And uh, Chris McGuire mm -hmm. is steady cam. He likes, and, and he's got lots of gear that he loves to use. You know, yeah. butt, butt dollies are a great thing. I don't know if you know, but these are. Just you know, like skateboard wheels on a small seat that you can adjust the height with, and and then you slide around. A lot of the stuff is just handheld, just mm. slightly lower angles, and you get these things. You know. Yeah. Um, he, he shot some brilliant things. There's a scene with uh, 
Riz Ahmed when he's doing his conferencing and there's a big screen behind him. And he was always low finding Riz in one side of the frame and balancing it with the mm. image behind, you know. It was actually, he shot some really beautiful stuff like that. Uh, yeah, again, but these were long takes again, I've got to say. You know, if, if there was a speech of three or four minutes, there would always be the beginning to end. There's no point in ever trying to start something yeah, midway yeah. or cutting right. it before you get to the end. Because anyway, so. a, a lot of these, the, 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 the rig or the steady cam or anything, they're, they're, they're all... They're all designed to deliver sort of smoothness, smooth yeah. smoothness, and sort of deliberate. Yeah. So, but of course, yeah. that very thing that you do, which is reacting and, yeah. and listening, and then going for it. Yeah, yeah it, it acts so, against you. That's what yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. There are a few steady cam shots in there. I know Paul kind of cringed every time we brought them out. You know, so <laughs> you know, should we get the steady cam out? And, you know, maybe it's just better handheld. Then you yeah. see that you follow people in over the shoulder around the corners and get to the place yeah, that you, yeah. you, and then go and settle into the shot. Yeah. So I, I know you've, you've, you've mentioned the focus pullers, but let's just, uh, just talk about focus pullers who, who, must, who must love you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, and um, uh, Ollie Driscoll was, was, the, was the, your first AC on this one. No, no, he operated on this oh, one. Oh, he operated? Yeah. Did, he, did he do it? No, didn't No, I bumped him up. Russell, oh, yeah, right. Russell yeah, Howard right, right, right. was, uh, was my right. first AC on this. Right. So he, yeah. The, the, um, I travel a lot because you do a lot of films all around the world and say commercials and you pick up crew and sometimes it's the focus puller, the first AC who will say, uh, I'm really quite nervous. You, you don't put any marks down, and I won't be able to. You, will you let me have a look and kind of measure things? And you know, I go like, "Hey, you're not. The thing is, you're not going to make a mistake. You're going to try, aren't you? That's the only mistake you can make if you give up. Right? But if you can, you'll find it. You'll find that the picture is there. They're, they're now with the digital uh, HD monitors as mm. well. You know, with the. Uh, fizzing lines around them so they can find yeah, the things peaking, it's, yeah, yeah peeking yeah. on it you can find the you can find the focus it's you know um it's not always that easy i'm not saying that makes it like mechanically easy yeah. it's also about intuition and knowing where to put the focus and sometimes leading the camera away so i think that a focus puller gets into a when you're into a rhythm with them they're adding an, another layer of, of creativity to the film yeah that is something else and i think you know, in, in many ways, when I'm shooting, I'm looking for two or three things to happen in each frame. Mm. You know, I always think it's like Henry Cartier Bresson. If you took a photograph, you'd notice that in the corner something's happening up here, and there's a cat running across the floor, and you know, and there's that moment of tension, you yeah. know, somebody of hovering over the yeah, water. The that's moment, a classic. Yeah, the, yeah uh, but I'm, we're trying to do that t 24 frames a second. <laughs> all the time, reframing, balancing the picture, making a good aesthetic and making, uh, and adding something else to the story, someone in the background is, is, you know, is just an expression of someone in the background. It is, you know, as long as you include it and it's out of focus, it doesn't detract from the main subject. In fact, it, it builds the subject up. That's, mm. that's how I see it, yeah. yeah. Even, it could even just be a dot of light or a, you know, a highlight of something, a bit of, you know. And a lot of it is, it has to feel random, but there's a lot of control over making mm. that randomness. You know, because you, you, I mean, you do some, you do similar things, but you, you know, if you're in a documentary situation, you've, you may have very few choices, but if you make the right choices in that situation, then you can turn an ordinary picture into something quite beautiful. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a way I put it is, there's the kind of, Painting with light, which is a, a true cinematic uh, method. But if you keep this kind of the looseness of this and the, and the chance elements, it becomes more like sculpting in light because there's a three dimensional element to it. I've got to say that they tried releasing, we shot this completely as a two, uh, you know, a regular film, it's not 2D, it's a film. It's a, we shot it as a regular film. They released it in, they, they 3D'd it, whatever they do, and then they released it in uh, China. But they just, the reports came back that it made them sick. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you get that report from this kind of, <laughs> from watching it here. Um, you know, that shows some of the kind of ridiculous attitude they have to 
what is cinema. I'm very against mm. 3D films. I just don't think they've got any purpose, really. But, um, you know, if, you don't, if you're not drawn into a film like this already and you're not yeah. absorbed by it and it's not, you, you know, then, then the film is no good, basically. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have to 3D it to make it good, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like producing a pop-up book of, you know, Dostoevsky. Yes. Yeah, it's like, a very good, where, 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 where I like that one, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, but, but, it's, but that, that thing about sort of taking it to the, taking it to the edge. Yeah. And then, because you, you know, doing documentaries, you know what obstruction, absolute obstruction is, and then what, how much you can just still see and, and yeah, just, yeah. so it's hovering around, around that. Around yeah, that yeah. It's, you, you try, and the other thing is you're trying to make the audience believe that this only happened once yeah, and yeah. it had to be shot like this. That's the, that's the kind of secret to the visceral element to it, yeah. is that, you know, and, and things out of focus or, 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 you know, where you're chasing something just adds to that level of, of interest, really. And, uh, you know, I... You certainly get the story. I mean, it, it tells the story as well as any, um, you know, period drama. You know, it, 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 there's no lack of story. There's no lack of understanding. I don't think. It's just that it's a way of keeping the audience on the edge of the seat, and that uh, yeah, it seems I think, to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we're, we're we're very we're now quite attuned to the you know to that that style of filmmaking. I think it's uh, with a largely accepted wisdom that the Jason Bourne series has, you know, gave another yeah. uh, Secret Service person, also JB, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of kick up the bum, really, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, sort of just yeah. I don't, yeah, 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 they're very, they're very different films, aren't yeah, they? But they're yeah. also, yeah, they, it's, you could see the similarities yeah. and, and how Paul very cleverly uh, changed perspective on it, I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's some there's some there's some scenes of real scale in there. I mean, the, obviously the the mm. Athens riot and the and the and the Vegas Strip there. Yeah. I mean, I was as far as working with your gaffer and sort of planning. Yeah. That, I mean, t tell us about. Well, yeah, Harry Harry Wiggins, Harry uh, Wiggins gaffer's uh, a lot of the films I've done recently. He's um, yeah, so he he's great to have the gaffer who can you make the big plan and. But yet keep it subtle and real, you know, and we've worked on that for a long time together. Um, he did the Green Zone, which, you know, where we kind of underexposed things for... I'll blame Harry, actually. It wasn't me, it was Harry. Um, yeah, no, so, you know, we... But knowing where you can take that and what you can get from it, you know, so those scenes, uh, the, the Greek riots, the, Math the Athens riots were... Um, well, which was shot in uh, Tenerife, by the way. Uh, they, you know, we have to kind of build an overall picture of it. Uh, and he's great at that. You know, great yeah. team of people. You know, every night, every afternoon, they would have to go out and relight certain sections of street from rooftops, and uh, you know, and I don't. F you, and then you feel that it's just happening within the, in mm. the street itself. I think a lot of the film, you're meant to think that was just available light. You know, you're not meant to think that was cleverly lit or anything. It's you have to throw some of that because it's not painting with light. You throw you throw the the painterliness away mm. to gain the sculptural side of it. I think that's what we're doing. You know. Yeah, if that yeah. makes sense. I don't know, but I still think it's beautiful and it looks yeah. nice. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've, I've always I've always loved your lighting. Actually, I think it's been a, it's sort of it's, 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 it's very you. unobtrusive and yeah. natural. Yeah. Always always has been. Which goes back to my Ken Loach days, where you right. you know it, it has a very, which Ken Loach has a very classical approach to everything he does, but he doesn't want any, any lights in the room. He doesn't want to see. He doesn't want to feel like that's very bright and that's very bright. You know, so I, you had to learn this method of softly, softly bringing in light into the space that you need it to get exactly the right thing. And the wind that shakes the barley is, for me, that's the pinnacle of that yeah. approach. You know? yeah. And it, 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 you know, that, when, when you get that kind of thing right, you know, it's, then it, that lifts the films to yeah. a level. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the average budget for a Ken Loach film would Three. several times into into, <laughs> into this one. Yeah. Did, yeah. When you move up to to a, a film of this size, mm. is it? 
how is it carrying that philosophy into 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 uh, my attitude is always the same. <laughs> it's, it's the same as if I was doing a, a, like a low-budget film. It's like, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, if you put one camera into your hand with, the, with a decent lens, uh, you can make a film, can't you? You can, you know, you have a subject, you can follow the subject. You may have three or four days to shoot it, or you may have a hundred days to shoot it, but you can still make a film that way, you know. And... Um, I, I, that's what I like to do. There's a, I, had to, I had to write in the prep period, which was quite a long period, to be honest. Um, Paul asked me to write something for Universal, and I, I wrote a little piece saying how wonderful it would be, how there'd be great car chases. I think I used the word awesome twice, uh, Always which I don't usually use. But, uh, but I, at the end of it, I said, um, but it's, you know, fundamentally, this is all influenced by films of the late 1960s, the documentaries of Leacock, Penn Baker, and Drew Maisel Brothers, the documentary films. Uh, and there's a quote from uh, Robert Drew, which I found on the internet, which just said, we said, fuck the dolly, fuck the tripod, fuck the crane, just shoot and shoot and shoot. And so I put that as a mantra <laughs> at the bottom, and I never got a reply back. But it was no. like, but I know they were, you know, they're very happy. I know, you know, the, the producers were on set quite a lot, and they're, you know, really nice guys. And yeah, that, you know, they come from some of them come from that background. You know, Frank Marshall and those people, you know, uh, you understand that they know the films that. You know the Hollywood films of the seventies, which were massively influenced by the documentaries of mm. before that. Yeah, so that's where we were coming from. You know, so that was it. Seemed to me to be the natural application of my background and the influence over American films. You know, so yeah, that was it. And working and and you obviously shot a lot of on film before with, with Ken and, yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and with Paul prior, but using, using a digital format, especially, particularly working on the edge. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about working on the edge sort of compositionally, but also yeah. exposure-wise. Yeah. So which, with the, 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 uh, the digital format, gives you a, an extra sort of well, it, it digging into that. Do, yeah. does, does that feel... Yeah, I, well, maybe, you know what this kind of links into is really uh, the grading of the film. The grading. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is such a massive part. When I watched the film just again, uh, which is the only second time I've seen it, the, um, that, that period of a month or so that you, I spent in the grade was you know, that blending these things together, the different formats, uh, knowing that film was bringing out certain qualities of uh, which you see. And then when we switched to the digital, say, for those... Well, for the, all the Las Vegas, I think everything in Las Vegas was shot digitally, even the day exteriors, because we just wanted one package, one by the time we got to Vegas, you know, so we, uh, you know, and it, it suited it, because it was glossier, and it was smoother, and it's, yeah, you know, I don't know if you've been to Vegas, it's got a, uh, it has its own particular qualities, you know, um, so it kind of suited the camera as well, you know, um, but other things we did. Uh, on film, and it was, you know, kept those qualities as well. Mm. And none of that would probably uh, be appropriate for a, a 4K digital transmission now. But I, but it's, you know, <laughs> but it's, uh, it stands in its own right, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. No, I mean, I love those, the, those, the, the scenes of uh, Vincent Cassell in, in, his, in his room, where, he, where we, each one when he received the call oh, yeah, yeah, to yeah. move on. It's yeah. just the television light. Yeah, yeah. The bedside light. Yeah, did we had, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you know, very I mean, small amounts of light, yeah. yeah. But, and but, again, it was like, you know, Paul was saying, you've, it's overlit. You know, you know you've done it, like, because you've got plenty of time waiting for everyone to get ready. You've added a little bit here, a bit there, and you've shown a bit of detail in the background, and, you know, it looked really quite... Beautiful, really. Um, and Paul's like, it would be less than that, that wouldn't it? You know, so you just take things away. You know? And that's often a method. It's just you, you, put in, you put in enough stuff to make it look great, uh, and then you take it away until you're left with the minimum that you can get away with. You know? And, then, and then, you kind of, then you get to the grade, and you go, oh, my God, we should have left some of that light on, shouldn't we? You know? <laughs> you know, and, uh, but then, so then you play with it again in the grade and you, you try and bring mm. that little piece out there and you say, is there anything in the background? And maybe there's just a little something 
you know, yeah. you could have made your life much easier, basically. But, yeah. but it's you know, I think that's my process. It's not, you know, like there isn't a particular lot for the film that I shot. You know, it was more to to gather the information, which I've always felt like that anyway. You know, like you gather the information and then, you know, with the knowledge and the and the history that you have, make the film look as good as you can on the day, and then and use all that experience from shooting on film where you had to make it right, and then go back to it later and, and mm. you know and work it out a little bit. Yeah, get the best from it really. And that, that's an important part. Of the stuff. You're always there, the, the great or you try to... I, I try, know, really try hard to be there, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's one of the fortunate things, you know, that you, you're you working with the top graders in the world as well, mm. you know. So, you and know, this is Rob, Rob, Rob Pitsy Rob did Pitsy, this, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, that, that means you're going to get a very good job done, you know. And there's money and there's a budget. You know, it's not like a, here's a... Here's a a day and a half grade on this film. You know, this film will be graded until it's right, you know. Yeah. And the visual effects will be added and people will come, you know, and if there's any really mm -hmm. big issues, maybe visual effects will come and help you out as well, you know. They don't tend to need to do it, hopefully, but that's, it is all possible, isn't it, oh. you know, so. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah. <coughs> Do you feel, um, off the back of what you were saying, when you look back at the film, do you think, oh, damn, I wish I'd, I wish I'd have done this or wish I'd have done that? All the time. Yeah, all the time you're wishing, I should have done this, I should have done that, you know. But um, I think it's that the method is almost as much... Uh, I, I find it quite satisfying when there's limitations and you can, and you can justify not doing something. So you might go like... Well, you know, they just don't know, but I couldn't have possibly have done anything else. You know, you don't know how hard this is, you know, some, you know that kind of feeling. Um, uh, and you know, then you realise it works out pretty well like that. So it, I don't, it, it, sounds, it, it could sound very lazy, this, or it could sound too haphazard. I mean, the reason I have a career doing this kind of filmmaking is because there's somewhere in between all that that makes it work. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, but I'm, I, I defy anyone, any other cinematographer, to explain exactly what it is they do. You know, it's it's uh, it's just a life of being a cinematographer. That's what I've done. You know, that's what I did from leaving my art school. You know, through assisting on documentaries, some of the first ones with Roger Deakin and Dick Pope. You know, uh, and then and. And Mike Fox, a great Mike Fox, that we, we both knew young, when we were younger. Uh, and working our way right through, you know, Ken Loach taught me, well, Chris Menges taught me via Ken Loach how to light things and then, you know, and how to compose things. And then it applied to other films that were outside of that remit. And then, interestingly, when Paul Greengrass first, first called me about making, um, uh, United 93, I said, is it the Ken Loach films that you like? And he said, no, no, it's a little film that I did called Under the Skin with Dominic Savage. Because that was much more exciting in a way, because I'd broken free from the Ken Loach thing. But everything is, I can say, refers back through my documentaries into Ken Loach and then on and beyond that, you know. Any more? One up there. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to know about, you were talking about the grade. How do you tend to work your grade? Are you in there every day, all day, for a month, or do you tend to pop it yeah. out? Or yeah, more or less, yeah. That tends to be the way, yeah. We, we'll set off making the first pass of everything and then get the whole film together. Do you ever find you get, maybe this is just lack of experience, but I find I kind of sit in there and I get a bit colourblind after a while. <laughs> like yeah, the room. that's very true. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's what the colourist is, <laughs> you know. Not that I could ever do that myself. But I wouldn't want to do that because I, it's this collaboration again. And everything you do on film is a collaboration. You know, you can't make one step without somebody being by your side, you know. Uh, you know, hence, I'm, you know, like equipment. 
you know, I'm totally reliant on the crew about the equipment, you know, like the camera team, you know, and they'll suggest, oh, this is, you know, wow, this is a new, this, you know, I've just done a film uh, where the director, is Catherine Miegler, wanted it to be 16 millimeters, super 16, but there was a lot of night stuff, and I kind of, just as we were about to commit to shooting 16, super 16 film, uh, the Alexa Mini was kind of geared up to use 16mm lenses. So I said, let's do the 16mm lenses on the Alexa Mini. You reduce the size of the sensor, but that's only like taking 16mm film to 35mm film. And, uh, and, then sh and then shot it in our, back in our style, you know. The, 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 what's receiving the image wasn't so, such an issue to us, you know. And the film has a very filmic quality because of that, you know. Again, it's not 4K. It's not. It's, it, it technically doesn't fulfil some brief at the moment, but it, you know, but it's released very soon, and I hope you go and see it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that didn't answer your question at all, did it? About grading? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, grading is is totally important, and I do spend a lot of time there. Yeah, I like doing that as well. It's um, yeah. You but you're using this collaboration, and I yeah. You but, do co yeah. you go colorblind. Yeah, you don't know. Is that you know? Is that too warm now? Or too you know? And the next day you come back and you try and change it all again. And you know, eventually you learn to settle down and let it happen. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's fair to say that colorists or I mean, they're, yeah. they're not immune to that. I mean, I, mm. I, I I've just you know, I, uh, uh, just finished a film and then we, we both sort of just you know say yeah. I can't see this anymore or yeah. you know, I've, we've gone so round and round we, yeah. let, let's just go out for a coffee and come back in mm. um, with fresh eyes so it's, it's yeah. not just it's not just I always you know, find the colorists say okay yeah let's go for coffee but I'm just going to stay here I'm just going to pick up a few things here and uh, make a couple of phone calls and yeah. they never get out of the dark room I don't know but I no, think there's I, a part of, partly they don't want to because if you change your perspective you sometimes lose your uh, your concentration, you know. It's, I'm sure it's the same with sound. I mean, you would stop hearing sounds, wouldn't you, if you were mixing sound continuously all day long, you know. Yeah. And by the way, the sound on this film is phenomenal. You know? mm. I mean, that's, that's, I think in the last 10 years, the biggest advancement almost has been sound mixing, on a post, you know, post-production sound mixing. You know, first of all, you have to record it very well, obviously. But what is added to the film just... It you know, blows you away, doesn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Microphone. Mike, yeah, Mr. Mr. Williams, yeah. please. Well, Barry, I must say, I was absolutely, completely involved in this picture. I mean, the tension didn't let up. Yeah. And I thought your contribution was absolutely remarkable. Thank you, thank you. And it's really interesting to hear you talking about your early days uh -huh. with Ken Loach and how you, as a cinematographer, have to adapt to what the, the, the way the director wants to do things. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, you've created a, a style there which is so much in contrast with the way Ken works. Yes, yeah. And the other thing that interested me is that <laughs> You're working with a leading man who's getting on in years. He's not as young as he was. Yeah. And, I mean, if you'd been working with Robert Redford, you, you wouldn't have been able to do what you did there because it was obvious that he gave you a lot of freedom in how you lit him. And, you know, it was never always very flattering. No, no, no. And that adds to the drama and the reality yeah. of it all. And, but the other thing is that when you had the scenes when he was much younger, and he really looked till you up younger. How did you do that? They were the scenes on 16. Exactly, yeah. Um, that was visual effect. Yeah, so, so the two things. The, the, thank you for all you said. That was great. The, um, firstly, uh, yeah, it, people fall into light. And like, I'm pretty much sure like the, I'm seeing here now. You, you, it's not always the most beautiful thing, you know. Um, but it's appropriate for the time. I mean, you're struggling to get you know, and maybe the next take you, you, you throw a little bit more diffusion on things and you try and bring it down to something that's a little bit more controlled. But they may never go to that same position again because you're not asking them to, you know. I mean, great actors do. Uh, you know, uh, Tommy Lee Jones would tend to repeat what he did very precisely. Uh, and knew where the camera was and would throw looks to the camera, you know, like glances 
toward the camera because we we love those kind of three quarter shots as well. You know, so over the shoulder, you know, a bit oblique, a bit, uh, you know, makes it a bit more draws you into the film a little more. Anyway, so yeah, they do, and he is getting older, and sometimes he looked massively uh, sophisticated and suave, and you know, and other times he was in, um, you know, when he's being killed at the end of the film, no, it's almost killed at the end of the film. He's, um, you know, that's not the most beautiful, <laughs> you know, it's, but it's, it's, you can't really, from my point of view, go stop, 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 we have to make this look beautiful you know, it's part of the story. It's fallen into that position, and I think that's where the excitement is. Yeah, the, the scenes when he's much younger, when his when his father's know. killed. How did you do that? Okay, well, that's the magic of the, the computer graphics. <laughs> yeah, he put he, he acted them out. Uh, the early ones were all from the earlier films. Actually, the, 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 there's a ti there's a kind of, almost like a title sequence where they they say this is what you've done, 38 kills mm -hmm. or something. So that was almost a title sequence made up of all the other material from the other films. But we then added to that, and that's the stuff with his father in Beirut, and they put little dots on your face, and it magically, because they have, they've sampled the face, and, they've sampled, and they can go back to their older material and add that on, and it was absolutely spotless. You, well, well part of the spot, that's the bad way, but it was uh, faultless. It was, yeah, it was brilliant. It was actually uh, quite brilliant, yeah. Um, but you know, he, I've got to say this, Matt Damon beefed up, he looked, there, there was opening sequence, we had to shoot the fight sequence, the, the early fight sequence in, on the border between uh, Greece and Albania, as it is. Um, he was so physically ripped at that point, he, he couldn't drink water through the day because that spoils it. You, you, Apparently, I learned a lot about. Can't you tell? Can't you tell? <laughs> um, yeah. He, he, anyway, he was incredible. Yeah, really, really fit. And then he had to do it again part way through the film. He had to take a period off of shooting another week, maybe. You know, where he was resting, but he was he was pumping up to get back to another fight scene. And it, you know, it's, I think it's, you know it's a mixture of actors being absolutely dedicated and uh, you know and able to do that kind of stuff. Visual effects getting involved to to correct, you know, age and things like that. We could, I could do some of it right now. So, <laughs> was he doing lots of his the, the, the stunts, Matt? Was he? Uh, stunt, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the fights, yeah. You can see he's in the fights, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he's, uh, um, yeah. And in same with Vincent Cassell, it's very, you know, very physical actors like to get involved, like to do the fighting. There was a, there was a lovely moment. Uh, where we're down in those sewers at the bottom of under Las Vegas, and they were doing the fight, mm -hmm. and they had to run through the rehearsed action, and they had two. We had two um, uh, doubles who looked very similar to them, and they both stood, so two and two, and they and they both went through the, you know, all this stuff, and. So all four of them were like, it was like a dance up and down the, this corridor. You know, it looked very, and it was, I thought, wow, that's really beautiful. Pity we can't film it, but you know, <laughs> you can only film the real guys at the real time. But no, that, I mean, those fight scenes and the, were enormous, you know. I've got to say, I'm pleased that we don't have to do the, the car chases and all that kind of stuff, you know. Most of, the, most of the kind of emails I received when the film first came out from people around the world was, Oh, it's awesome. The films look great. That car chase is just amazing. And I'd like, <laughs> the car chase is Simon Crane. And, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll pass your message on to Simon. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. And just, just to clarify, how, how long did they have to, to shoot that? Um, they had uh, the car chase, I think they prepped for it to, well, they, for a month, intense prepping for a, a week, two weeks. But they were only allowed a very small period, <coughs> period of time on the, those Las Vegas streets. And uh, they were very limited. They, they wouldn't close down the whole of the strip. Mm -hmm. They had to use one lane in the strip. And, you know, and, and Las Vegas, you can't close down. It was like drunks rolling around all around it. So it, how they managed it, I'm not quite sure. You know, this, there is footage on the internet where you can see Luma cranes flying through the street and all that kind of stuff. It's brilliant, yeah. Uh, 
you know, first of all, they have to choreograph it and come up with this, mm. the ideas, and that's that was weeks and weeks of work. Yeah, yeah. They were on it for as long as we were on it. The film, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, the the motorbike chase is through the streets of Tenerife, you know, the hills and stuff, and the steps. That was all fantastic as well. Yeah. yeah it looked great. It looked great. Any more, gentlemen? There. Um, you mentioned the three D version they made in China, and actually, I watched it in the cinema. It really make people sick. So many people just <laughs> oh, really, yeah, yeah. so many people just quit before the film ends. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, is it a kind of damage to your work and the three D transfer? Yeah, I think it dam damages the work. You're saying, yeah, I think it does. Yeah, uh, there's no. I mean, we shot it with only this intention. This is what we shot, and to take it and then to apply something on top of it is, yeah, it's. it's it's uncinematic. It's, uh, it's, it's against, you know, they, may, uh, they do. I don't know, they, they take films and they regrade them. If they, if they think they're not uh, right for that audience, you know, they can do that. They have the right to do that in these studio films. Um, you know, I think I've been lucky in that I, I don't think most of the films I've worked on have, have been tampered with. Um, 3D got mentioned a few times in prep, but I kind of, you know, you have to say, what is it you're doing? You're making a film for the cinema, you know, uh, and it's to be screened, you know, in this case, 3,000 cinemas across America and probably three or 400 cinemas in Britain simultaneously around the world. You know, that's what you're making the film for, you know, you know or a festival, if you're going to a festival. If, if, you know, if it's, if it's a small budget film, you still want to make your film look the best it can. And then secondly, uh, you know, if, they, if they're choosing to make a 3D version, that's just financial. It's just to say, okay, for another $3 million, we can make it 3D, but it'll turn out over another $100 million in China. I don't know, I don't, you know, that's, the, that's what happens when you work for corporations. You know. That's the fact, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It's true, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you, know, yeah. you know, you know what I say. You, say, I read. You, if you might have read my articles, I, uh, you know, I, I don't indeed, have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I, cinematography is is you know an art form that uh, you know that is you know I think the most important art form and the most important part of making a film. It's you know we should the respect that we deserve. Uh, you, you know, which does exist as you're on set. You know, people told, have total respect for your directors and. You know, and actors do. You know, they, they mm -hmm. but and producers. It, it's just that sometimes there are some parts of this industry that have become so industrialized and run by accountants and and uh, and lawyers that if you you know we're, it's out of touch with what we're doing. Yeah. So now they, you just lost yeah. me all my work. Now what have you done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the, 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 the sort of lower budget films where, where, where you came through, that would be, that would be an arena where, that you would, that yeah, feels comfortable, yeah. purer. But yeah, but I'm lucky. I've just worked with Catherine Bigelow and that's mm -hmm. another, she is, you know, and Annapurna Pictures and they're, they're a completely different, that's a different ball game really. They are totally on side. Paul Greengrass, totally on side. You know, um, Adam McKay, you know, Ken Loach. I've been very lucky that you know that uh, they, that, you know, the, the world, uh, their world of cinema is coincides, you know, with us, with mm. me, and that's how I, uh, you know, that's how I managed to get these kind of good gigs, really, isn't it? You know? Well, I mean, you know, great work will breed great work. I mean, that's normally how how it, yeah. how it works. So. And great directors help you to make yourself better. I mean, yeah. That's a very fortunate coincidence, yeah. really. You know, I, I always feel that if you get to work with the best directors, they're going to make you do the best work, you know. And likewise, you help them to do their best work, you know. Yeah. Is it, was it a tight schedule on this, or did you actually have the time to kind of light your scenes, or does the fact that your style kind of well, allows you to kind of dictate to um, shoot it quite quick and your lighting's coming from a, a kind of a central source, um, or do you, do you kind of, you know, 
nitpick it's a, with the lighting a little it's, bit. It's a really get, good question. It's something, it's something of all those things. It's a big budget. You've got plenty of time. But we, part of the method is to create this certain amount of uncertainty. You know, a typical thing, and this is not a critical of anyone, but, you know, Paul Greengrass might say, we're going to do this piece. We come here, we, we recce this place, and it's going to be this audience and stuff. But, um, you know, but we really only need these close-ups here and here and, and one shot of the audience like that, and then that's all we need. But when you get there, you know that it's going to be, you know, we're going to walk in from outside and come into here and go up there, and then there'll be something in the audience. And you know, so, uh, but he may be throwing those in as he goes. And like I referred to, then pieces of script come back to you that you've all, you've already shot this scene, and now you're going to go back and and do it again with some more stuff. It, you're always on your toes, and that that and that attitude I mentioned before of like. This is just like doing a documentary. You keep that element. You have the t we've had. You have the time. I, you know, you could spend more and more time lighting it, but it wouldn't make the film better in my mind. You know, um, you know, you, you, you're constantly saying I would go back and do it again differently. But uh, given all the circumstances that you have to take into consideration, that that is the result. And I think it's. Uh, it's the result that Paul wanted. It's the result that Universal wanted. It's the result the audience want in the end, you know. And I think that's so. It's finding that balance, yeah. yeah. Like I said, it's great if you had more and more limitations, the better, you know. So thinking that there are no limitations, that's the worst place I could be, you know. Here's an open check. Just do whatever it is you have to do, you know. I mean, you could light. I can light things beautifully. It's easy. Not easy. It's, I can light things beautifully if I need to, um, but it, it has to be appropriate, you know. And, and there's a, um, uh, an energy to working that way as well. Yeah. It? Which, which, yeah. This. You have to create that energy. Yeah, yeah. You know, like so when you said when we did U nineteen ninety three, you know, it's, you, we could have broken it down into little shots of everybody on the plane, you know, mm. and gone around and done things, or we or you know, what I offered to Paul was let's just shoot 40 minutes at a time. You know, let, they'll act it out, we'll shoot it. Let's see how that works, you know, as if it was happening for real. And that lifts that film into another level, you know, a completely different level. In fact, you know, I think that film is actually almost immaculate. In the, when I look back on it, it takes me years to re realize what it is you've actually done on a film. But you, when you look back at it, there's no, there's no wasted energy. All that and there's a lot that you can feel the, the energy that went into the film and you get it all back plus ten times, you know, it's an amazing film. Very good. A couple of questions here. Uh, ba Barry, uh, um, I, I don't think that... Um, uh, the, I don't think that, the, that you've been lucky with the directors. I think the directors have been lucky with you. Thank That's you. the first thing I would say. Thank you. Um, to go back to the documentary style, which does intrigue me that the great cinematographers that we have, uh, Chris Meng, as you mentioned earlier, yourself, um, learned from the documentary background. Now, um, in, your, in your work, uh, with, with, for example, on, on, on The Hurt Locker, where anybody who knows anything about film knows that the film, the success of that film, was because of your work. You. How did you feel when the Oscars were given and you were ignored? <laughs> well, it, it had followed the BAFTAs and I was awarded the BAFTA, so that was, you know, that was good. But the, um, and it was my first trip to the Oscars. It was a bit of a show, really. It's a, it is, there are TV shows that you happen to be involved in, you know, basically. <laughs> and, um, and it was the first 3D film that it was up against. But that also and against uh, the four, there were four very good films, which anyone could have won an Oscar for sure, and one film that was 3D, and, and it was a novelty. And somehow that, I'm not being rude to Mario Fiore, because he says the same thing, I know. But <laughs> not quite like I would say. But he said, you know, that it didn't deserve to win the Oscar because it was more of an animated film and, you know, and the films, the other four films that were uh, up for Oscars in the cinematography, you know, should probably have won that film, uh, for the, that, that award. But like I said, um, 
I got the BAFTA, and that's you know, and that and the respect from that is you know, I think fantastic. Yeah, and the film still won six Oscars and six BAFTAs, and it cost five million dollars, and it was up against the most expensive film in the world, as Avatar, and and Catherine had been married to uh, you know, it, it had a, it was a great story, and. And I'm very, really pleased that I, I got the opportunity to go to the Oscars, you know. But then I don't think you need to keep repeating that as a, as a life. I'd also said to myself, I will never go to Las Vegas ever. I promised myself, I would turn it all down. <laughs> but in that one year, the the big uh, uh, the big short, the big short needed scenes in in uh, Las Vegas, so I went to Las Vegas, and then. I, got, I finished that, the big short, I came back and 10 days later I started prep on, on the, um, the Bourne film and said, okay, the first thing we're doing is going to Vegas. So I'm back on a plane <laughs> to Vegas and we went three times to Vegas that year and then we went back at the end of the year and then we started, what would it be, 2016. Uh, Shooting in Vegas, so I spent an awful lot of so time. So you've got membership to many of yeah, them. all the clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really, really rich now as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got to say, if you do ever go to Vegas, just take a little trip out to the mountains. It's absolutely the opposite of Vegas, and very, very beautiful, very spiritual place. Lovely, yeah. But not the Strip. Down here. <coughs> Hi, um, you mentioned that um, you went to art school and yeah. I just wanted to know a bit more about like how you started out um, and also if you have any tips for people that are starting out in the industry. Like yourself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like us. Yeah, good, yeah, no, it, well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, it wasn't easy because I was, I'd gone through an art school system, uh, but I knew, I, I just knew that I was <coughs> a cinematographer in my heart and I knew that's what I was going to do, sculpture, so it became... Uh, the only way in was doing documentaries because it was it was pretty hard. The uh, the union, the ACTT, you know, was difficult. You had to be a member to get a job, or you had to have a job to get a, to be a member. So that was all quite tricky. The BBC, you could work for. We ended up um, working on a lot of BBC and documentaries, and Channel Four came about, and music videos came about. So they gave us everybody a break. I'm just saying for Roger Deakin, Dick Pope and so on and so on. Um, so that was our way of getting a break. I think the, the advice for you guys is to get yourself into groups of people making film because and it doesn't, in a sense, it's what you're doing. You're making a, a small network of people. And I, I'd say include musicians and actors and writers and painters and, and make yourself into a, a movement and make films because I think from that, that's where you'll be recognised, and there's, you know, there's a massive expansion happening. You're in a really good place now. That I think there's going to be more and more content necessary, and I think only high quality content has any value. You know, that's you know, and I think the BSC represents that. I think that's our aim is to preserve the the vision to, to you know, and I think that's what's important is that you learn your trade very well. You practice it, which is the best way of learning. And to practice it, you've got to you've got to get out there and go and make it. And then people come looking for you in the end. You know that's it doesn't happen straight away, but they'll come find you because content is necessary. And I, and you know I wish you all the very best of luck. You're going to be future of the BSC and British cinema. I mean, you know we have a very high standard. We have the, one of the greatest standards of cinema and cinematography in the world. And I'm really proud to have been the president. I'm sure Mike will be a great, great president following on from me. You know, and, and there's many other presidents here. It's just, you know, that's the future, is being great at your job, uh, being, uh, be, being yourself, being an individual, finding your voice, uh, you know, and understanding that it's a collective already. You're never out there on your own. You're with someone else all the time. That's the only way. I would have been a sculptor, if I, but I would never have got out of bed. You know, I needed, I need a call sheet to tell me what to do. <laughs> but when I get, but when I get the call sheet, you know, my energy and my life just like, you know, I'm 63 now, and people, you know, I turn up on set and they go like, 
Yeah, you know, all those shots inside the cars, by the way, you know, like traveling shots in cars and things like that. You're like, Chris McGuire's six foot six, and you know, I just go, you wouldn't get in the car. So, and it's not that, I love it. I get in, I got my, leave the seat, I get, I get the camera, you know, and I struggle with the camera and I love it. And I, you get out, you just feel, I feel more energized by doing that than standing by the monitor. It's not my way, but that you've got to find your way. It could be beautiful lighting, it could be, a visceral style, it could be whatever, you know. But, uh, you know, you'll find it. I think that's, that's my advice. <laughs> but, but do it well. Whatever you do, do it well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a perfect okay. note. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the, the signal that, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that, we're, that we're done. Um, Barry, thank you very much for your past work and for your future work. That you, Great films to come. You thank you for the last three years of presidency. Thank you. Um, thank you. And, um, thank you very much. Great, Mike. Thank you.